Now, I ask you to, to have Joshua, chapter 8, over you remember what's happened. He's gone, brought them through the wilderness, 40 years, and now across the, across the Jordan where they had reinstated all of the things that God wanted to do and the rites of circumcision, and all, every man, every male was circumcised there at Circumcision Hill. And then how Jericho fell and they killed everything in it and took it because God says, I'm going to get... I'm going to let my name, it's Canaan land, and I'm going to let every name there die, but your name, that's what he said, and everything I've given to you. Then you also saw them when they went to Ai and they messed up and how they failed utterly and miserably. And you saw the, you, you saw the, the, uh, the, the man lying on his face and God said, what are you doing on your face? Get up. He said, I'm, I'm praying, Lord. He said, it's not the time to pray. You miss prayer time when you should have been praying, but you missed it. Now get up and let's get going. And he's coming to this one now, and here's what is going to happen. And, and I'm going to be one who reads some scripture. I'm not sure how much. But I want to say to uh, Matt, welcome back to the service today and for having your little, your little beautiful little girl, uh, Ava, Claire here today, you and your wife, God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Welcome in the service. Here goes. I want you to hear it. I'll give it to you in King James and John, okay? And the Lord said unto Joshua, listen to what he said now, fear not, neither be dismayed. Take all the people with you, of war with you, arise and go to Ai, you see, I've already given the hand of the king into your hand and his people and his city and his land. And you shall do to Ai and her king and all that is in it as you did to Jericho and her king. Only the spoils thereof and the cattle and sheep and all the prey, you keep it to yourselves this time. But I want you to lay an ambush for them and you be in the city behind it. So Joshua rose and all the people of war, about 30,000 of them, to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out 30,000 mighty men of valor, the fighting men, and sent them away by night. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, you shall lie in wait against the city, behind the city, but don't go very far from the city, but you be real, always ready. And I and all the people that are with you and with me will approach unto the city. It shall come to pass when they come out against us, as at first when we got beaten here, that we will flee before them, for they will come out after us till we have drawn them from the city. For they will say, they are fleeing just like they did the last time. They are scared. Let's go get them. Then you shall rise up from behind the city where you are and your ambush and seize upon the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it shall be, when you have taken the city, that you shall set the city on fire. According to the commandment of the Lord shall you do it. See, I have commanded you. And Joshua therefore sent them forth, and they went to lie in the ambush. And they abode between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged that night among the people in front. And he rose up early in the morning and numbered the people and went in, went up, he and the elders of Israel before the people to Ai. And all the people, even the people of war that were with him went up and they drew near and came before the city and pitched on the north side of Ai. Now there was a valley between them and Ai. And he took about 5,000 men and set them to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. And when they had set the people, even all the host that was on the north of the city, and their liars in wait on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley and waited until morning. Hmm. Now, I didn't read you everything, 
but I'm in a simple way so that a fifth grader can understand it, a fourth grader. I want you to understand what God does and how he fights. He's different from you and me. He's not complicated. We're too complicated. He, he is very uncomplicated. I want you to picture Fort Bragg. I want you to picture Delta Force, 82nd Airborne. I want you to picture Special Forces, all of this. And you're going to see what they did right here and the training that they had. They are Jews. And you're going to see something fabulous. Amen. You can be seated. So how many of you have ever bought something and it didn't turn out like you ordered it? Can I see a hand? If you ever ordered something, they say you can send it back in 30 days and didn't send it back. How many, be honest now, how many of you are like me? Didn't send it back, okay? I don't know why we don't. The guy with the pillows comes out and said, I'll give you two pillows. He said, and there'll be 60 days on this and you can keep it. And if you don't like my pillow, if it's not the best, send it back and I'll give you money. Nobody ever sends a pillow back in an envelope. I don't believe not many people would do it. I remember the time I bought a house. We did. And I said, man, it's the nicest looking house. It's got it made. It's little, but it's nice. In the summertime, however, we burn up. We didn't know what the world was wrong. I said, it's the hottest house I've ever seen. We got to get window fans and portable air conditioners and blocks of ice or something. It's really bad. And then when the winter time came, we froze to death. I mean, it was something. And we said, we got to check this thing out because we're freezing. It's just like you're on the outside. And the house that was the greatest, they had limited it out by failing to put any kind of insulation in it. Well, we said, oh Lord, if we don't get some insulation on top of that, we're gonna freeze to death. And we had to do things like that. And it was a nice house, but it had some flaws. But when we got through with it, we turned it into something great. There was another occasion when I bought a car I bought a car and I thought it was really the best in the world, but it happened to be a lemon. It was a Renault. I assumed the payments and I headed it down to the coast with Fade just for two or three hours just to show them my nice 1959 black Renault Dauphine. And when we got 10 miles down the road, it stopped going because in the trunk of the car where the motor is, I thought it was in the front. I got out and looked at it, it stopped. I looked in the front and there I just saw an empty trunk. It was in the front. I said, they really got the car before the horse here in France. What did they do? And I went around the back and it was steaming and smoking and everything had gone and messed up. It was a lemon for sure and I had bought it. I bought another one and I said, boy, what am I gonna do with it? And that car turned out to be a lemon, but not since then because I tried to get a brand that won't be a lemon. I don't want a lemon, but I found that God would turn the lemon around and make lemonade out of it. Have you ever had a failure in life and you said, Lord, I just cannot make it through this failure? Can I see your hand? How many of you have had failures in life? How many of you have actually made a blunder? You said something you shouldn't have said, you did something you shouldn't have done, and then all of a sudden you learned that it was wrong and you said, what am I going to do? And you felt that you couldn't do it. How many of you have done that? Can I see your hand? I see them, okay? I have. I've said things and I said, Lord, I shouldn't. No, failure just says you shouldn't have said that. The thing about her is she's, she, uh, oh, she's here today. I'm sorry. Look, uh, uh, she cuts me no slack. And I said, Lord, what am I going to do? I've had times in my life when I've made decisions on my own. I've made decisions with others. And then the decisions turned out bad. And I said, Lord, what are we going to do? I want to tell you what God has done. In the 50 years that I've been here, I have made some decisions that have been wrong. And the decisions... I thought were gonna kill me, but the decisions turned out right and God made them into good things. He took my blunders and my mess ups and he turned them around to something good and I'm still here and I'm still going and I could have been lost a long time ago had I not had the grace of God to say, I am one who can turn these things around every time. Listen, I, you heard the scripture, and I, it is my mystery scripture. You say, what is it, Revelation about those frogs? No, my mystery scripture is in Romans chapter 8. You know what the mystery scripture is? Chapter 8 and verse 28. Anybody remember that one? Let me see your hand if you do. And it says, you want to say it with me? Say it after me. And we know. And we know. I didn't hear you. I want everybody to say it. And we know, and we know. that all things 
all things work together. Amen. You know it doesn't say that, does it? It says all things work together for good. Come on, for good to them that love the Lord. And to those who are called, say it, according to his purpose. People come up to me and they say, well, you know, said, I just believe it's going to be all right. I said, why? They said, everything works out for the good. Said, that's what the Bible says, doesn't it? The Bible does not say that everything works out for the good. It says it works out for the good of all those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It is not for the worldly man. It is not for the man who is in sin. It is not for the man out there, even though sometimes God does that too, and I don't understand him. We'll talk it over. It's okay, but I'm telling you that God knows how to turn things that have been wrong into something that is right. And I've watched him do it in my life. I've watched him do it in decisions. I've watched him do it with personnel. I've watched him do it with the cars. I've watched him to do it with, with ministries. I've watched him do that, and God tends to know when to turn things around. And it brings me to you. Here you are today. Some of you have problems physically. And you say, how do you know that? I know you. And I know that we have physical problems. And some of you have financial problems. I mean, I don't even have to ask for an amen on that. Some of you have some kind of family problems. Some of you have some kind of problem or another. And you're saying, wait a minute, why is this happening to me? What is God going to do about it? Here's what I have found that God does not leave us as quick as human beings leave us. God comes to take a mistake and turn it into a blessing. He knows how to take blunders and turn them into blessings in your life. I've watched him take uh, desert experiences and turn them into mountaintop experiences. I've watched him do that. I didn't understand why he did that. I didn't understand why he loved me. I didn't understand why he cared, but God knew what he was doing every time. And God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Somebody else may forsake you, but I'm not going to forsake you. I'm always going to be there. It was so in the life of this man who is one of my Old Testament heroes, Joshua. This lean, mean, green, fighting man named Joshua. He knew what he was doing. This man really knew how to, how to get him. He had some tragedies in his life. He had been one of the leaders coming through the wilderness. They followed. And now he gets him across the sea and stands in the middle of it in, in the, at the Jordan River. And everybody gets across. And he has all those reinstitution of the godly laws there. And they stick with him, stick with him. And he has a Gilgal where they all de deliver the thing back to God and throw off the reproach. He has that. He's there. And he's a leader. And he goes out reconnoitering at night and he sees something happening in Jericho and meets the man that says, I'm neither for you nor against you. I am come as captain of the host and I'm going to lead you right now and you're going to win because I've given you the city. But I want you to destroy everything there. And Joshua gave it out and said, this is what the Lord says, destroy it all. And God was with him. And now he pulls a blunder. And I want to see if you in your leadership, in your corporation, in your, your office, your family, whatever it is, I want to see if you can identify with me on some of those things that have happened in our lives. Blunders that we made. Some men come to him, they were his advisors. They said, listen, We've already scouted out AI, and we want you to know that we can take it. But we don't need but three or 4,000 men. Just give them those, and we'll go up, knock them out, and we'll come back here, and don't bother everybody. Piece of cake. And they went because he said, well, I, I, guess, I guess it's okay. You came on at me like a whirlwind, but I mean, you sure you've checked it out? You know, all the, you know, go ahead and do it then, man. Don't even bother me. I'm here. And they went, and they came back all beaten up, and they'd lost 30-some men had killed them sliding down the slopes of the quarry, coming back on the Judean hills, going back toward Gilgal, where they had encamped. He felt responsible for it. He knew something had gone wrong. The moment, hear this, the blunder comes in your life, whether it is with your company falling, whether it is with someone else that's messed up in your group, whether it's with you that's messed up, whether it's a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, when you make the blunder, listen now, you're going to know it. 
You're going to say, wait a minute, I got to go ask somebody else. If, did I make the blunder? You don't have to ask it. You'll know when you've messed up. Can I get a witness from anybody? We want to go to somebody else to hear them lick our sores and wounds and say, oh, it's not too bad, man. It's okay. You know when you've messed up. Say amen, somebody. Every time I mess up, I don't have to ask anybody. I know when I messed up. It's a time, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm no better than this man right here, and he's no worse than I am. Because that's the time when I go down on my knees and knee work happens and I start crying out to the Lord saying, God, what am I going to do now? Lord, I've messed up. Lord, we've messed up. Oh, God, what am I going to do? And God says it to me just about like he did Joshua when he comes and catches him lying down on his face. And God said to Joshua, Joshua, what are you doing with your face on the ground? He said, wait a minute, God, I'm praying. And he says, well, it's not the time to pray. It's the time to act. Well, when should be the time to pray, God? Joshua, you should have prayed like you did when you were at Jericho. Joshua, you were on the mountaintop, and that's the time to offer a sacrifice unto me. And Joshua did that. But this time there was no sacrifice. There was nothing. And this man got into the valley and there he prayed. Thank God for the valleys. And I want to tell you something about the valleys and you. I don't have any problem in dealing with you or what you're going to do or how you're going to turn out when you're in your wilderness and you're in your moment of temptation or trial or whatever you're going through. In that moment, you're going to come out strong. Where I have problems with you is when you're on the mountaintop. When you've got the whole world by the tail. And you're just leading on, saying, oh, God, I got everything, man. Look at me the way I preach. Look at me the way I sing. Oh, I sing like an angel. You better be careful at that moment. Because in a moment when you think you stand, that's the moment that we fail. Because it is at that moment when we pour on ourselves, Lord, look what a good job I've done when you're on the mountaintop. When the truth of it all is that we couldn't do jack without Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit working on the inside of us. That's the time to get religious when you're on the mountaintop. And you'll save yourself a problem in the valley. He said, Joshua, get up. And of course, I told you that story a couple of three weeks ago. Joshua got up and he says, now this is what I want you to do. And Joshua then found out what was wrong. There was somebody in the camp that had disobeyed God, a boy by the name of Achan. Now I want you to put yourself in Joshua's position, okay? It's difficult to do, but let's say you're the leader. What are you going to do when you find out and God says to you, hey, Joshua, somebody's defiled me and somebody's gone against what I told you and you told them we had to do. You remember, Joshua, when I stood with you outside the gate just before the fight on that night and I said, I'm, I'm captain of the host. Joshua, you know something? I asked you to tell them something. You told them, you said, nothing in the line of the goods, nothing in the spoil, no sheep, no cows, no gold, no money, no robes, no nothing will ever come with you. Joshua, you told them that. And one has disobeyed me. And Joshua, when one disobeys, it spreads like yeast in the camp. And Joshua, it's spreading now and it's hitting some people right now. Joshua, you got a problem here bring them together, and he brought them together out there. And he separates them according to tribes, and immediately the lot or whatever it was fell upon that tribe of Judah, and they singled out Achan, an Achan young man, promising young man. He had the looks, he had everything. He acted right, he was nice and good, and he was a good leader and everything, but he had one thing that was wrong with him. He had in his mind, not God this time, the major thing that was taking over in his mind was dollar marks, it was money, it was things that he wanted, and he lied about it, and he cheated about it, and he went and he said, I love that robe, it looks like a hard shaft of marks. Let me get it, it's a Babylonian robe. And I like a bar of gold. Oh, God, there's more gold than I've ever seen. Lord, I want that bar of gold that weighs a little bit more than a pound. And give me the silver coins, Lord, because that's very valuable. And I'm going to hide them. And he hid them, everything. And down deep, deep into the soil in his tent, he buried the silver coins and the gold and the robe. 
Joshua said, boy, tell me what you've done. Don't lie to me. He said it, son, I want you to know what you do. And he said, I saw it and I took it. He just immediately confessed it. I don't know why God didn't spare him except that God said, you got to pay and God can't go back on his word, okay? I don't know why God said, I've, I've sought it over many times. Why did God say, don't you keep anything at Jericho and then turn around at Ai and say, you can keep everything there. I don't know, God. I'm not supposed to be understanding of these things and neither are you. It's just that when God says something, you had better be jolly well assured that you better obey God. For to obey is better than sacrifice in the fat of the rams. And you've got to be obedient unto God. And if you don't, you won't be known for your money and your robes and your gold and your silver. You'll be known that you violated the voice of God. I want to put myself in this place. I'm, it's going to be hard for you to do it. it, it it's scary. Here we are with all the people of Israel watching. They're searching for the man that's done it. Joshua, you've got, to, you've got to give the death sentence to that man. He's got to do it like this, like they did in Rome. Thumbs down on him. It was hard for him to announce the execution of Achan and his wife and his family and his cows and his horses and his dog and everything that he had. It must have been difficult for him to do that. He's in a state of misery, but he did it. And there's the blunder in his life. Here it is. Now, you may say, well, you don't ever do this, do you? No. I've already told you we make mistakes. When you are leading, now this will go for preaching, for singing, for teaching, for ushering for Bible studies, for every, everything. You had better learn and cultivate your mind to listen to what God says and train your ear so that you can hear what God says rather than what Brother Bucketmouth says. But sister, well, I'd rather not. She knows everything, and if you go to her, she's going to give you the right advice. Do you, sister, sister blubber lips, can, can you tell me, do you think it's okay for me to do this? Oh, I think it's a piece of cake, man. Every time that I've ever gotten in the deepest of troubles is when I went to someone else and said, would you tell me before going to God? Because it's easier to go to one of them than it is to God because you say, I got to know, and I got to know what it is. I got to get everybody for me. I got to get everybody. And so we end up spending our time doing what we call gossiping. When we depend upon someone else more than we do God, you're going to get in trouble. We must cultivate ourselves so that we learn to listen to the voice of God. And we're scared to do that because it calls for making a decision. This is why I say it's going to be hard to put yourself into Joshua's position, into a position of leadership. And if you cannot make a decision like that, do not let anybody put you into leadership. Before long, we'll accept some other people into leadership in the church. But you cannot, you must not ever let anybody put you into leadership. Unless you have an ear that is trained to God and you're not afraid to say, we go to God and ask him to do it. Or if you're one of those, get over and say, hey, brother, what do you think about that? Oh, well, I'll tell you what I think. About. Let's go and ask so-and-so. You're in trouble already. You must have a gift of the spirit that says, I have the gift of listening to God. And when you start saying, I want to be a leader, if you say, well, listen, I can help you. I can do it, man. I want to be the leader of that group. Do not seek for that place. Do you want leadership? Then do not seek for it. Do not advertise for it. Do not ask somebody to vote for you. Amen. I nominate someone. Don't do that. In the kingdom of God is different from the kingdom of the world. God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
He still knows how to pick a boy out or a young person out or a woman out or whoever it is down at the sheepfold when everybody else is marched by and says, and I'm king of the hill, man. I'm the one. I'm the one you're looking for, Samuel. Samuel, it's me, man. Look at me, man. I'm six foot four and I got it, man. Oh, no. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside. And while man was looking at the man on the outside, God was looking deep into the heart of this boy, killing the uh, ten and the sheep down there in the pasture and said, that's the one because he's a man after my own heart. Now, what I'm telling you is that you have to be very careful rather than saying, man, I know I'm a man for the job, man. I've, I've been to school, man. I got an ed education. I can do so-and-so. I led somebody in the Boy Scouts. Don't do that. Pray, oh God, I pray that you won't do that. Well, I believe I'm full of leadership, man. I built a rabbit box one time. Listen, if you seek it, stop seeking anything. Joshua, listen to the wrong voice. And when you listen to the wrong voice, you end up in trouble. It's why I am not afraid to allow God to work through you after we have prayed and prayed and we never select anyone until we brought them in and laid hands on them and said, we want you to separate yourself, do you know? And we go through that and then the church like you that are spirit filled, you have always picked the right ones. I wanna tell you that. I don't know how you do it, it's by the spirit of God. We must listen to God, not listen to everybody that throws it in. You understand, say amen. Just a thought, okay? Joshua didn't do it. And his first mistake came when he listened to the popular boys who knew how to fight. And he didn't listen to God. That's where the problem came. He hated to do that to that boy. It was a state of, of disrepair for that whole nation when they had to do away with him. But here's what I wanna give you a second. When you make a blunder, the only reason I can say this, I've been along the way here, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm giving you my experience on that. Listen, when you, I'll cry for you if I could. When you make a blunder, how do you say it? When you mess up, it's as far as I'm going with the synonyms, okay? When you mess up, you gotta understand that the same God that called you the first time will come to you and say in the eighth chapter in the second verse, he says, fear not. That's the first word he gives. Fear not and do not be dismayed. Be not dismayed. Whatever, be tired. God will take care of you. Others may forsake you. But I promise you, God will not forsake you. And God is a God of the second chance. You may mess up by choosing the wrong man. You may mess up utterly by choosing, excuse me, forget the utterly. You may mess up by choosing the wrong woman. You may mess up by going to the wrong school. You may mess up by going to, to anything, getting in the wrong place. You may mess up, but God doesn't write you off. He comes back and he says, I'm giving you another chance. Do not be dismayed and have no fear. He always says that. Why does he say, listen to me a minute, listen. Why does he say, do not be dismayed and have no fear? Why does he say that? Because he knows that we are fearful people. You say, you're scared? You're mighty right, I get scared. It scares me to have to pick people. It scares me to have to make decisions. It scares me to have to stand before people. It scares me to death to have to stand before you and say what I'm saying today because I know that I'll be held responsible for it in the future at the judgment. I'll be held responsible when you understand that. It scares me to say it. I said, oh God, what am I going to do? He says, be not dismayed. Fear not because I am with you. And I'm telling you, I can feel the power of God right here. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, but I can feel the power of Almighty God flowing through me from head to toe. I think I could stick my hand into a socket right now and it wouldn't feel anything because what I feel is greater, but I'm not gonna test it, okay? I'm not supposed to tempt. Listen, 
God comes back and he says, don't you worry. I got a whole thing under control. It's all under control. You got the wrong man, I'm gonna make it right. You got the wrong woman, I can make it right. And God can turn the thing around every time if you give him a chance. Now, if he didn't turn it around for you, you already got another one. You can't get rid of that one. Like one woman came to me one time standing right out there, and she said, Preacher, she said, you know I'm married to so-and-so. And I knew him personally. He was a friend. And she said, but I, I, I can't stand the way he smells. I said, oh, my Lord, don't say that. She said, I can't. I, I, I tell you, preacher. She said, and, and my first husband said, he's, he's, he's off in another town. I said, how old is your first husband? She said, he's 93. I, she said, do you think I need to leave this man and go back to him? I said, absolutely not. Don't you let the devil tempt you to do that because you can't unscramble eggs. God says, I give it over new with you. Now let's make something out of this one. Everybody, come on, clap your hands on that one. Glory. You got the right one now. Hallelujah. I heard one man, that, one man had a wife and he brought her in one day and you know they say love is blind. I can't understand it. He said, he looked as happy as any man you ever saw in your life. But she looked like she was rough. The girl people said, why didn't you say the man? Because it's the truth. She looked like a combination of, of, uh, of uh, one of those Wagnerian singers, you know, ah, you know those, and a trailway bus all put together. But he loved her. And he never said, look what I got. He took her home with him. And they lived for a few years, and about 10 years later, he came back, and you know what? You could have looked at that woman, this pastor said, you could have looked at this woman and said, he got him a new one. And he got the man to the side and said, did you change? He said, oh, no, she's the same woman. Get ready for this one, boy, people, listen. He had let God do a metamorphosis, a workover, before they ever had complete workovers. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Y'all got to stop. What am I doing here? You know, God help you to help me, Lord. What am I doing? Look, he loved that woman and he bragged on her so much that God was in her and they prayed together so much that she changed and she changed. Over the, you can change if God's in it. God will change everything but a fingerprint. Look, you got to let God, I know it. You got you to let God have your life, Okay. God can take a blunder and he can turn it into a blessing. He can take a lemon and turn it into a blessing. <laughs> Let him do it. He did it with Joshua. And Joshua said, I'm going to make it anyway. See, God knows when to straighten us out. Let him straighten us out. He's a whole lot better than people are at straightening us out. God is after getting us back on the right track. God knows how to keep you on the right track. It looks like everybody but me today, okay? God wants you on the right track. God doesn't want you oh, to just going all discombobulated all the time. God's got some purpose for you. He's got something good for you if you'll only let him do it. And God knows when to come back. He said it to, to Joshua when he was in the wilderness. He said, don't be dismayed. Moses said that. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and check them out over there in another land, Canaan land, and come back. And then when he got ready to go again, and he, and he laid hands on him, said, you're going to be the leader. He said, now, you look at the first chapter of Joshua. Be not dismayed. Don't be afraid. Fear not, for I'm with you. And I'll go with you everywhere. And now he comes back to him at this time when he's messed up, just messed up good fashion, and says, do not be afraid. Do not have fear. And do not be dismayed. You know what I find? If there's any one thing that hurts Christian people, it's dismay. It is fear. We fear everything. What's your greatest fear today? You, you fear that you're not gonna have enough money? We asked a group of pastor's wives one time sitting right here, and the pastor's wives wrote, growing old and alone. But the most of them put, the thing we feel the most is growing old and being poor. That's the truth. 
They wrote it in their own hand. Is it that your child's in the arms, oh, excuse me, not in the arms, he's, he's all wrapped up with somebody else, that's even bad, that he's going to get married to somebody and you don't think that's the right one? By the way, remember what you did and God did something great for you. God knows what he's doing. God knows how to bring you back on the right track. God knows how to do all of these things for you. Now, I want to give you something the Lord gave me once. The one that you get your advice from is the most important person in the world to you. Will you remember that? The most important person in the world is the one you listen to. So if you listen to your wife, make sure she's got good advice. If you listen to a deacon, if you listen to a board member, if you listen to a pastor, you better make sure that they have proved that they can give you the right advice, okay? You've got people that you can listen to. It's good. But you've got to make sure that you corroborate that with the Spirit of God working on the inside of you. Here goes. I'll get to the end of the story quick. Joshua said, give me all the fighting men, 30,000. It's right there in the 8th chapter. 30,000 men, I'm going to give him. He said, I want 5,000 to be, I want 5,000 Green Berets. Or well, how about Delta Force? I want them to separate from this 30,000. Leave me 25,000. He said, now, here's this right here. Look, this is, this is our AI. He says, we're going up, and I want before in the night, I want you 5,000 Delta Force boys. I want you to go around Take a sagebrush, take anything you want to, and go around and hide behind them. 5,000, don't let them hear a thing. Don't make a noise. Be far enough away so that they won't hear you. And, but be ready. You got it right, I read it to you. But you be ready. And uh, I'm going to give you a signal. And he had told his main man what his signal would be. It would be with the spear, now that we know anyway. It was with the spear. He said, when you see the spear go up, that's when I want you, I want you to attack. He said, but what we're going to do, we're going to camp out on the other side of the hill. We're coming in in the morning, and we're going to stand there, and we're going to get there in the morning, and I'm going to be with them. And then those guys are coming up, they're going to look out, and they say, there are those Jews again. Those Israelites, go get them, team. And they're going to come out, and then we're going to retreat. We're going to run as fast as we can, and they're going to say, go get them, everybody. Everybody, go get you an Israelite. Go get you a Jew boy. Go get him. And everybody ran, will run out of that um, camp, out of that city of Ai, walled city. And they're going to come after us. And we're going to keep on running. And they're going to think we were just like we were the first time, running from them. And on that morning, they didn't see anybody behind them. The sun came up. Joshua got them ready, hit that spear, and they were ready. And when they started at those doors, he said, all right, 25,000, head out. And they started running. You didn't want to get trampled. They started walking, and they started running, and they started coming after them. Then everybody, every man, every soldier in that little city, I'm almost to the end, listen, everybody in the little city came out after them. And they started shouting. They said, hey, they got a spinal problem. Yellow streak up it. Look, they're running again. Let's go get them. Fee five four from. I want one of those little Jew boys in my tent tonight. We'll get him. Put him on a stick. Until everybody was out. And then the spear went up just like this. And when Joshua put that spear up, like the sword of the Lord, okay, they made their move from the back and rushed in. And they didn't even see it because they had their eyes on what they were doing. And into that city they went. And Joshua said, set fire to everything in the city. And they had the torches, the kerosene, whatever it was ready. They had the lighter wood, they had sage brushes, they had everything. And they lit up everything in that city. And these guys are running, these AIs, I don't know what you call them, AI, 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 AIs. They're running like this and all of a sudden said, I smell something. What does that smell? Hey, that's our city. Did you leave the stove on? And before you knew it, it was a conflagration going up just like that. Panic hit them. Looking back saying, that's our folks, our wives, our children. What are we going to do? What are... And here turns Joshua, held that sword up again. And the men struck in the city. And the 25,000 turned around and slew every one of them. 
and said, now that we've got all the soldiers dead, I want you to go back and we're going to kill everybody in the city. I don't understand God. You don't have to understand God. He said, but my name shall be raised up high. And they killed every one of them, 12,000 of them, lying dead, and not a single Israeli was dead. And they killed everybody but one. They saved old King Ai, the king of Ai. And before sundown, Joshua said, I want to show you what we're going to do because I want everybody to know that God's name is the one that we're going to go to. They took him and whittled out a nice, sharp, with the hatchet, with the machetes or whatever. They took him and stuck him when they killed him first and put him on that pole and lifted that pole up and he was skewered on that pole, impaled, impaled, and dropped it down in the ground. And they passed by it and they said, God's name shall be revered. He said, all the loot is yours. It's the way God does it. And you say, why does God do that? I don't know. I just know this, that when God speaks to you, you had better do it. If I could never teach you anything else, it would be this. The most important thing is, is that you know that the one you listen to is the most important person. That's why I want to make sure that I'm close to right, if I can be. And I want to make sure that I've heard from God. Okay? Well, I want to tell you this right now. I've heard from God. And God gave me this message for you. It's why I didn't give it on that day. Because God wanted me to tell you something. That he specializes in things that humans don't. And he wanted me to ask you one more time. He wanted me to ask you this little question. Listen. Got any rivers? You think are uncrossable. Got any mountains that you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. And he will do what no other friend can do. That's for you today. All your problems, all of everything, God's going to work them out. Because he's going to give you the anointing to be able to work them out too. If you will only start listening to him. Now, I know we're not shouting. I understand that. You could be. But I'm going to ask you plain as day right here as your pastor. I'm strong enough to give it. You're strong enough to take it. That's the way it is on this beautiful October morn. Are you ready to make a decision to be what God wants you to be and to allow him to turn your blunder into blessing? On your feet, come on. Before we go, I want to ask you right now. All heads raised. Every eye open. But you're looking in your heart right now. How many of you want to make sure that you are ready to go when Jesus comes? Pastor John, I am going to make sure. I must be ready. I got to put mine up one more time right here today. I want to be ready. Can you say it? Put your hand up high and say it. I'm going to be ready. I want to be right. I want to be prayed up. Read up. Paid up. Witnessed up. And ready to go to heaven.